In the second part of our presentation, we, I want to bring you an update report on the recent rediscovery of the Sabbath by various church leaders and religious organizations. Indeed, the rediscovery of the Sabbath by scholars, pastors, and churches is an unprecedented phenomenon of our time. If you were to look, for example, at the directory of Sabbath-keeping churches published by the Bible Sabbath Association, you will be surprised to find that there are over 400 seven-day Sabbath-keeping churches and denominations in the United States. What I would like to do quickly this afternoon, I would like to bring to you a brief report, first of all, of the publications, then of the conferences, uh, of Sabbath conferences, and then of the various churches and organizations who are re-examining and rediscovering the Sabbath today. Let me start out with some of the books that you may like to hear about. For example, a very refreshing book to read is this book, Keeping the Sabbath Holy, by Martha Don. She's a Lutheran theologian who captured with refreshing insight the meaning and the experience of the Sabbath for today. When I heard her giving a paper, a lecture there at the University of Denver, I was thrilled to see how this Lutheran lady speaks so eloquently about the Sabbath. In fact, there is also a very interesting Lutheran magazine which came out some time ago, which uh, has as the cover title, Call the Sabbath Delightful. And it's indeed a delightful article to read, written by Lutheran lawyer Judy Finn. She tells the story of how she discovered the Sabbath through a contact with the Sabbatarian in her community. She says, I discovered that the Sabbath is different from Sunday. And it says, I found that the Sabbath is a sanctuary in time. It is a time when we can begin to experience eternity and its peace. Isn't it beautiful? Another book I'd like to mention quickly is entitled Catch Your Breath, God's Invitation to Sabbath Rest. Now, all of these books, by the way, are all written by non-Adventists, people who are just rediscovering the Sabbath today. The author of this book, for example, is Don Postema. He's a chaplain at the University of Michigan. And you will love to read the, the book. It's only 150 pages. He tells the whole story of how he discovered the Sabbath. He was looking for inner peace and rest in his life. He tried transcendental meditation. He tried yogi. But nothing really satisfied him until he was introduced to the Sabbath. And he found that on and through the Sabbath he could experience mental, physical, and spiritual renewal. And the whole book is not an argument in favor of the Sabbath, but more of suggestions on how to keep the Sabbath to really experience this divine rest in our human restlessness. Let me also mention an interesting journal that was recently started by scholars of different denominations. It is called Restore, and as the title itself suggests, the goal of this journal is to restore the biblical, hebraic roots of the Christian faith. And what is interesting, there are scholars of all denominations contributing. And this particular issue was devoted to the Sabbath, restoring Shabbat, a time for God and the family. And they invited me to contribute an article. And the title of my article is The Good News of the Sabbath. In this article, I present the three glad tidings which the Sabbath contains and proclaims perfect creation, complete redemption, final restoration. The Sabbath tells us that God has created us perfectly, that He has redeemed us completely, and that He will restore us ultimately. One of the most unusual places to find an article on the Sabbath is in the most popular American newspaper, USA Today. Did you notice this recent article on the weekend edition entitled, Remember the Sabbath Day? The article is excerpted from a book 
by Wayne Miller, and the title of the book is The Sabbath, Remembering the Second Rhythm of Rest and Delight. It's a beautiful article to read, by the way. In this article, he makes a special plea for a rediscovery of the Sabbath in America today. He closes by saying, I make a special plea for renewed Sabbath keeping in America today. As a nation, we cannot live like this, endlessly rushing about in a desperate frenzy, never stopping to enjoy the blessing of family and friends, unable to taste the fruits of life. We can change society by beginning a quiet revolution of change by rediscovering the Sabbath. He says at the very end, God does not want us to be exhausted. God wants us to be happy. Let us therefore remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Isn't it exciting? You know what? Shall I tell you something? He was on a radio talk show in Los Angeles recently. And an Adventist lady heard him on, the, on her car radio. She was quite impressed by the eloquent way in which he was presenting the Sabbath. So she called me on the cellular phone. So, Dr. Bakyuki, you know what? There is a man speaking so eloquently about the Sabbath on the most popular Christian radio station here in the Los Angeles area. They are going to open the lines in a moment. You should call in. You should call in. I said, can I listen for a moment and see what is going on? So you know what she did? She put her cellular phone next to the radio. I was able to listen for a few minutes. Then I dialed the number, and they told me there were four people ahead of me. Well, I was long distance from Michigan. I said, you know, I'm calling long distance, number one. Number two, I'm also a professor who has written four books on the Sabbath. I would love to dialogue with Professor Miller. Is there a chance you can give me priority? No problem. We put you on the air right away when they heard that I was an author of Sabbath books. And so for the next half an hour, we had a great time to proclaim together the Sabbath to the listening audience there in Los Angeles. Very exciting, isn't it? You know, another unexpected place to find an article on the Sabbath is on the United Airlines Hemisphere magazine. I'm one of the best customers of United Airlines. I'm a K1 one million mile flyer, and I always take a look at their magazine. And I was surprised to find a very special article on the Sabbath. The article is entitled, Ancient Wisdom. If you and your family are drowning in a sea of to-do things, try to do nothing for one day a week. And in the article, this dear lady, Nan Chase, who is a correspondent for Washington Post, she tells the story of how she discovered the Sabbath through a book that she found in the coffee table in the doctor's office. And she says that she decided because this book was speaking how Sabbath can also bring healing to marital relationship. And her marital relationship was rather strained at that time. So she says that I decided that from sundown Friday until sundown Saturday that we would join the Sabbatarian in no cooking, no shopping, no paying of bills, no pulling of weed, no pruning shrub, no cleaning or repairing the house, not even talking or thinking about work. And you know what she says? Right there you will find the statement. She says, my personal life, my professional life, my family life have all improved. And I plan to go on celebrating the seventh day Sabbath. This is United Airlines magazine. What do you say to that? Isn't it exciting? You know, Ellen White says in early writing, page 33, that in this final hour of world history, the Sabbath is going to be proclaimed more fully. And sometimes I wonder if this is happening not only through the Adventist proclamation, but also from the proclamation and, and publication of dear people of other denominations who are rediscovering the Sabbath and sharing it with others. Let me mention a very important Sabbath conference that was held at the University of Denver. Incidentally, we have had conferences in different parts of the world, in different places. We don't have to, I don't have time to give you an update report on all of them, but let me mention this unique conference at the University of Denver, 
We were about 100 scholars from all over the world. The goal of the conference was to re-examine the relevance of the Sabbath for our tension field and restless society, and the outcome of the conference was a fresh appreciation of the Sabbath for today. In fact, the university paper published a story of how this conference came about. Is uh, there you can see Institute to host international Sabbath symposium, and the article says, for example, that the director of the uh, Center for uh, Judaic Christian Study, Dr. Wagner, he said that he heard an audio tape of Adventist scholar uh, 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 Samuele Bacchiocchi from a lecture given on the Sabbath. What happened? I was there in Denver at the first Denver church, and on Saturday night, like tonight, a young man who was a student at the University of Denver, not only he bought my, the green book, Divine Rest, but he also bought my cassettes on the Sabbath, and then he loaned it to the professor. And this professor, Wagner, listened to the tape and read the books, and then he called me one night, and he told me by phone what he wrote on the article. He said, I was so impressed by the speaker, by his love and commitment to the Sabbath, that it seemed a golden opportunity to bring together Catholic, Protestant, Jews, and Sabbatarian to re-examine the Sabbath for today. So he called me that night. He said, I just listened to your tape. I read your book, Divine Rest. You have excited me about the Sabbath. I'm thinking about the possibility of bringing together the leading scholars who have worked on the Sabbath Sunday subject over the past few years and have an international Sabbath conference. Would you be willing to come? I said, Dr. Uh, Wagner, don't repeat this twice. Once is enough. I'll be excited to come. And I was given the opportunity of delivering the keynote address. All the papers that were presented at the conference were published in this book, which is entitled The Sabbath in Jewish and Christian Tradition. Folks, you know what? This is the only book written by scholars of all denominations who speak eloquently about the Sabbath. Uh, isn't it amazing? You have Anglican, Southern Baptist, and Methodist, and uh, uh, people of different faith, scholars who have contributed chapters to this book. And let me tell you this. They gave the responsibility to a Catholic scholar, a professor, Dennis Kennedy, to respond to my paper. Since we are in Texas, you might be interested to know that uh, uh, Dennis Kennedy is a Dominican scholar, professor here in Texas, in Houston, at the St. Thomas Catholic Theological Seminary. When I heard that he was going to be the respondent, I got a little bit apprehensive because I know that in my paper, I presented some of the information which could have been seen to be a rather confrontational, particularly when I dealt with the role of the papers in changing the Sabbath to Sunday in early Christianity. So I was prepared from some kind of a, what shall we say, debate, you know. But you know what? When he began, he was so gracious. He says, after reading the books of Dr. Bakiyoki and listening to his eloquent presentation, I am not in the mood for confrontation. And you know what he did? You, would you believe it what he did? He gave the most beautiful sermon on the Sabbath I have ever heard in a long time. For the next 40 minutes, he gave a beautiful meditation on the relevance of the Sabbath for our tension field and restless society. And when he came to respond to my paper, he said, for example, this is all in the book, by the way. I'm just quoting a paragraph from the book. We humans need to experience God's sanctifying presence. So we keep the Sabbath to follow the divine example, to acknowledge God as creator, and to participate in God's rest and blessing. The Sabbath is the sign of the covenant between God and us. Through the Sabbath, we look back to the past perfect creation and forward to the ultimate salvation. Isn't it beautiful? Catholic priest with his dog collar speaking so eloquently about the Sabbath. You know what happened? I got so excited. You can tell. Sometimes I get excited a little bit.
Sometimes I got so excited that when he finished his presentation, I sprang forward, I grabbed his hand, I said, Father Kennedy, may I extend to you the right hand of fellowship into the Seventh-day Adventist Church? You proclaimed such a beautiful sermon on the Sabbath. You deserve to be an honorary member of my church. He looked down and said, well, thank you, thank you. I'm not so sure if I'm prepared to accept it here and now. I knew that he wouldn't accept it. But uh, I thought it was beautiful that it was a Catholic priest giving such a beautiful presentation on the Sabbath. Now, let me share with you an incredible, an incredible experience. The visit of Dr. James Westbury, who is the executive director of the Lords, the Alliance of the United States, he came to pay a visit to our family right there in Michigan at Andrews University. Let me tell you how it came about. I sent to him my Sabbath books, particularly my book from Sabbath to Sunday, my doctoral dissertation. I always believe in sowing the seed. I always believe in giving the benefit of the doubt. I believe that's why I wrote such a lengthy open letter to Dr. James Kennedy, because I like to believe that he's a sincere man who may be sincerely wrong. And we must not assume that just because he's not a member or a preacher in our church that he's a hypocrite. You follow me? I always like to give the benefit of the doubt. So I sent him a copy of my book, and he responded with a beautiful letter where he proposed to come to Andrews and visit with me. In his letter he says, it would be a great joy to meet and talk with you. Such a conversation would give me additional ideas about how the Lord's Day should be observed. If you propose a time and a place for such a get-together, it would be an honor for me to meet and talk with you. Mamma mia! I said, what am I going to do? I asked my friends there at the university, should I dare to invite him? What will people think if the executive director of the Lord, the Alliance of the United States, come to Andrews University? They may misinterpret, but most of my friends say, what is the problem with it? That's a good witnessing opportunity. Why not invite him to come? And he came, and we had a delightful Sabbath together. He was our guest of honor in Sabbath school, guest of honor in the divine service, guest of honor in our home uh, for Sabbath lunch. I invited a number of colleagues to engage this man in a meaningful conversation. And you know what? I can never forget this noble-looking gentleman eating those Sabbath lasagne that my wife prepared. I wish I could give you a taste of those lasagne. They melt in your mouth. They are so delicious. And he was so excited. He ate them so fast. At a certain point, he was almost tempted to lick the plate. And he was asking all the time, said, Dr. Bakyoki, what is it that makes them so good? What is it that makes them so good? I said, Dr. Westbury, there is la salsa sabbatica, the Sabbath sauce that makes them good. So please, please ask your wife for the secret recipe of the Sabbath sauce so I can add some gusto to my Sabbath celebration. And my wife didn't want to share it because in our Italian tradition, we offer the food, not the recipe, you know. The recipe are a family trademark, like Coca-Cola. They don't give the recipe to everybody, you follow me? But I prevailed upon my wife. I told her, you know, darling, the Christianity sharing. We have to learn to share even the recipe. So when I wrote my book, The Sabbath, in the New Testament, would you believe it? There is a whole chapter here with 20 of our favorite Italian Sabbath recipes. So if you like to add some gusto to your Sabbath celebration, you have the recipe here. Now, let me tell you what happened. Let me tell you what happened. When I took him to the airport that um, Saturday night, you know what he said? Sam, I want you to know that this was the most delightful Sabbath I have ever celebrated in my life. It was the only one. Obviously it was. <laughs> the most delightful one. He says, would you be willing to come to Atlanta, Georgia? Next February 14, we have the annual meeting of all the board members of the Lord's the Alliance of the United States. And I would like you to share with them what you have shared with me today. So he extended me an invitation to be the keynote speaker there in Atlanta 
at the headquarters of the Southern Baptist Convention. There were 150 religious leaders. And I was given one hour, I spoke for 70 minutes, where I shared my research and made a special appeal in rediscovering the Sabbath. And would you believe it? All of them, with the exception of five Catholic bishops, all the rest stood up and gave me a standing ovation. And 36 of them requested my Sabbath books. Among them, there was Norman Vincent Peale, one of them who requested the books. But let me tell you the most incredible part of this story. Just before this godly man passed away, Dr. Westbury, he wrote me a beautiful letter. In fact, I have his letter right here with me. I have a bunch of letters that he has wrote to me. And in this letter he says, I thought of you a million times. Your books are on my desk. I see them every day. I'm grateful for you and for all what you have done to the cause of Christ and of his Sabbath day. I wonder if you would be willing to do me a big favor. This is what I have in mind. I've been wondering if it were possible for me to contribute financially to establish an endowed chairs for Sabbath studies. I checked with Andrews University to find out how much it would take to establish an endowed chair that could pay the salary of a professor who would devote himself full-time to research, to write, to publish and promote the Sabbath. I was told by the dean of the seminary that it would take half a million dollars. So I, I called Dr. Westbury and I said, well, it takes about half a million dollars to generate enough interest to pay the salary of a professor on a continuous basis. Well, he said, Sam, that is more than I can handle. I would be willing to contribute, he said, $150,000. Would you be willing to raise the rest of the money? Well, I was prepared to do that. But a few months later, he passed away before his dream could come true. But don't you think that is beautiful? That he was a man who spent 25 years of his life promoting the cause of Sunday keeping through education, publication, legislation, and now on his deathbed, he felt the conviction, the compulsion to contribute financially to promote the biblical Sabbath. What do you say to that? Isn't it beautiful? I thought you might appreciate hearing about some of this development. Now, let me tell you about some of the churches that are rediscovering the Sabbath today. First of all, about the Sabbatarian Methodist. Dr. Steve Sanchez, a Methodist bishop, accepted the Sabbath in 1996 after reading my books and also reading some of the early sermon of John Wesley. John Wesley is the founder of the Methodist Church. I was not aware of it, but he sent to me those sermons. Would you believe it? In the early day, John Wesley was a seven-day Sabbath keeper. And the writing of John Wesley, the early writing, are being published today on a bicentennial celebration of, of, of his work. And in the early day, was a seven-day Sabbath keeper. So this uh, uh, Methodist bishop, Steve Sanchez, after reading my book and the sermon of John Wesley, accepted the Sabbath, started sharing the Sabbath. And would you believe it? Sixty-eight Methodist congregations have already accepted the Sabbath and moved their services from Sunday to Saturday. That's very interesting. About 5,000 members. Let me also tell you about Sabbatarian Mennonites. Uh, have you ever heard of the Mennonites, by the way? Do you have them in this part of the country? We have a lot of them there in Michigan and in Indiana. The Mennonite interest for the Sabbath goes back to their finding fathers. Some of their pioneers were Sabbatarian. For example, Andreas Fischers and Oswald Glade. They were former Catholic bishop that became Anabaptist, that is the... Uh, the name given to the Mennonite Church at the time of the Reformation, and they became the pioneer and promoter of the Sabbath. And both of these men suffered martyrdom. You should read this biography of Andreas Fischer and the Sabbatarian Anabaptist written by Daniel Litchi, a Mennonite professor. It's an incredible biography. He spent two years in Europe visiting all these archives and libraries, reconstructing the life of this man, of how he discovered the Sabbath, promoted the Sabbath, was captured, was hanged outside the castle. 
for his Sabbath preaching. Would you believe it? The rope broke. And he fell down and was able to escape. And for the next two years, he was able to continue proclaiming the Sabbath until the authority caught up with him. And they drowned him and his wife in the Danube River. And to play it safe, they put a big stone around his neck and they drowned him in the Danube River for having committed the offense of proclaiming the seventh Sabbath. These are the founding fathers of the Mennonites. And this man... And Daniel Litchin even asked me to write a foreword to the book. And after doing all of this research, he was so convicted about the Sabbath that he himself became a seven-day Sabbath keeper. But let me tell you more. One of the leading seminary is not far away from Andrews University, where I have taught for 27 years. I just took an early retirement. And you know what happened? I got a telephone call one night from the president of the student association, said, Dr. Bakyoki, we are using your books in one of our classes of Professor Swartley, and your book has generated so much controversy. Would you be willing to come and spend a day with us? We would love to interrogate you. We would love to ask you some questions. And so I was there on a Thursday. I spoke in the classroom. I spoke to the whole student body and to all the faculty at noon in the chapel exercise. And the reception was extraordinary. After the presentation, we had a very friendly discussion. And at the end of the discussion, an Old Testament professor, he looked like an Old Testament personality, white hair, long white beard. He looked like Father Abraham to me. You know what he said? He stood up and said, after listening to the presentation and to the discussion, I can see that there's a definite interest on the part of some Mennonites to return to the biblical principle of seven days Sabbath keeping rather than arguing about it. He said, why not open up our church doors on Saturday morning so that those who have this conviction can worship God on the Sabbath without interference. And would you believe it? I just, been, I just learned recently that now right there in Elkhart in Vienna at the Associated Mennonite Seminary on the Sabbath, there is a group of students and faculty members who come together they're in their main chapel to worship God in the same way as you and I have done today. I thought you might interest it or not that. Now, I could tell you about many churches, but time is very limited, so I need to move fast. Here is the Church of Israel, located in Shell City, Missouri. Their pastor, Dan Gaiman, that became a good friend of mine. We have interacted many times. In 1987, he decided to leave his church on a study of the Sabbath. And um, actually, it was in 1985. And for two years, they used many of my books. They ordered them repeatedly. And he led his congregation in a study of the Sabbath. He told me that he did not want to make any change until every single family of his congregation had become convinced about the Sabbath. It took me two years. But he said that on December 17, 1987, the church voted unanimously to move their services from Sunday to Saturday. He wrote a little report for me, and notice what he said. The transfer from Sunday to the biblical Sabbath has brought... Uh, has been one of the most important spiritual events in the life of our church. It has wrought powerful transformation in the life of all our church members. He says that um, the church has doubled its size and increased its evangelistic outreach to every state of the Union. Over 1,000 people have joined the church in the celebration of the Holy Sabbath. We were together in Australia, in Sydney, at that famous Bi Sabbath conference I told you about. I wish you could have heard this guy. He was a fireball. So exciting that all the Adventists attending there were overwhelmed. And would you believe it? During a week, he had seven invitations from Adventist churches in Sydney. Every night, he went to a different Adventist church during that week to share his own testimony of how his congregation has rediscovered the Sabbath. Let me tell you about the Sabbatarian Southern Baptist. After all, we are in, 
in um, Fort Worth, Dallas. This is Baptist country, isn't it? Isn't the Baptist church very strong, predominant in this part of the country? You know what happened? On February 12 and 13, 1999, I was invited to present my popular Sabbath seminar at La Sierra University in Riverside, California. On Friday night, at the end of my testimony, the pastor Dan Smith and the president Larry Geraghty approached me and said, you know, Sam, at the very last pew, we have the pastor of the First Baptist Church. His name is Alan Stanfield, and he's sitting way in the back with some of his church members. Would you be willing to come with us and visit with him for a few moments? Surely, I said. We went there in the back. We spent half an hour together. I gave to Pastor Stanfield an autograph, free copies of my latest Sabbath book, you know, the Sabbath under crossfire. And would you believe it? He came back the next morning. He came back on Sabbath afternoon. And when I greeted him on Saturday evening, he said, Sam, I want you to know that I'm determined to re-examine the Sabbath for myself and my congregation. You know what happened? A week later, I got a request from one case of this book. He got about 50 copies that he wanted to de- give to all the leading family of the congregation. And for the next six weeks, they used the book as a kind of a study guide. And you know what? On April 21, 1999, this is the letter that he wrote to me. He says, uh, we voted to become a Sabbath-keeping church on April 21, 1999. He says, your books were a tremendous help in our search for the truth, which included the historical events which brought about the change from Sabbath to Sunday. And the following Saturday, because April 21 was a Wednesday night when they had their business meeting deciding on the change. And the following Sunday, April 24, for the first time, the first Baptist church there moved their services from Sunday to Saturday. If I had time, I could tell you of other Southern Baptist churches, a couple of dozen of them who have followed the same example. And you know what is exciting about this? What I find it very interesting is that there are, they, they are seven the Baptists, as this round logo says, but they are still associated to the Southern Baptist Church. In other words, they have requested their mother church, the Southern Baptist Convention, to accept them as Seventh-day Baptists. There is a Seventh-day Baptist denomination, by the way, but they did not join the Seventh-day Baptist Church. They are still associated with the Southern Baptist Convention, but as Seventh-day Baptists. Isn't that interesting? This is a very interesting development. Now, let me tell you something very recently. I've been in Orlando, Florida several times this past few months. You know why? My daughter is there teaching at the School of Nursing of the Orlando Hospital. And my wife, during the winter, she asked me if she could go down there because it's much warmer. She cannot take the cold Michigan weather so well. Every time she goes out when it's cold, she gets a terrible migraine headache. And so she went down there. And what did I do? Well, Every other week I accepted an invitation, a speaking engagement in the Orlando area. I have spoken, I don't know in how many churches there. And one weekend I was there at the Winter Spring Church, beautiful church. And there was this pastor, Ronald Cargill, who came. Notice what he says. I've been the senior pastor of the Harvest Tabernacle Church in Apopka, which is one of the suburbs of Orlando for 35 years. During that time, he says, I have challenged the Sabbath many times. In fact, he told me that he has written a book against the Sabbath. We attended the meeting. He says, I attended your lecture when you were here in Orlando area recently, and I was truly blessed and bought every one of your books. And to make a long story short, he had a 400-member congregation. He lost most of his members. He only got about 67 he left. But would you believe it? 
he has been attending an Adventist church right there in Apopka, Orlando. And when I was there, when was this? About five, six weeks ago, in Daytona Beach, which is not too far away from Orlando, the pastor of that church, the Adventist pastor of that church, gave the rest of the story to the congregation. On Saturday night, during the question and answer period, he stood up and said, uh, said Dr. Bakyoki, you might be interested to know that Ronald Cargill, with the whole group of his members, are attending my church now, and they are receiving Bible study and plan to join our Seventh-day Adventist church. I thought you might be interested to hear that. I could tell you also stories about Catholic bishops who have joined the church. Here I have a letter from Bishop Julius Massey. He had been reading a copy of my book from Sabbath to Sunday that an Adventist lady loaned him. So he wrote to me to get his own copy. He says, I believe that your book will give me the information which I have long sought. And in the last paragraph, notice what he says. I sincerely desire to know the truth. If one is sincere but wrong, he's still wrong. Folks, isn't that a beautiful confession to make? That if one is sincere but wrong, he's still wrong. And I want you to know that there are a lot of sincere people out there who are sincerely wrong. And God is giving to you and to me today unprecedented opportunity to reach out to these people. I wish I could tell you some of the story of some of these church leaders. Another Catholic bishop, his name is Giuseppe Fradale. I think I have his letter right here with me. You know what? He invited me as the guest of honor for his baptism right there in New York. I have his letter written in Italian. Beautiful letter. He said that my research had been instrumental in helping him to accept the Sabbath and join our church. So he invited me as the guest of honor there at his baptism. And when I went there, he told me the whole story, how providentially the Lord led him into the beautiful Adventist message. I wish I had time to share that story, but I noticed the time is running very fast, and I need to um, bring this presentation to a close. Let me mention another interesting experience with Reverend John Rogers. He wrote to me this beautiful letter but he tells me that again he had received a copy of my book from an Adventist lady. He was to return it to her and he wanted to have a copy for himself. He says here, no minister library can be complete without such a wonderful book. But what caught my attention was the last paragraph where he said, I feel that your book will become one of my best tools in helping my church member to become seven days of a keeper. You know what I did? I prepared the whole package. I sent him not one, but all the four Sabbath books I have written. I sent him my video recording, my cassettes, everything. And I was wondering what, what would happen. And you know what happened? Three months later, on a Sunday morning, the telephone rang. It was our Adventist pastor from Pontiac, Michigan, who called me. His name is Royce Mentor. He said, Dr. Bakioki, do you remember sending a package of material to Reverend John Rogers of the Church of God, surely. I've been wondering what has happened. You don't want to have to wonder anymore. Yesterday, he joined our church on professional faith. He would love to come and talk and visit with you. Would you be willing to receive him? Surely, I said. I'm teaching in the morning, but I'm available in the afternoon. And next day, Monday, 3 o'clock, both of them were at my house. And we spent a delightful time together. I remember asking John Roger, my new brother in Christ, please tell me, John, what difference has the Adventist message made to your life, to your ministry, to your relationship with the Lord? And you know what he said? He said, son, I want you to know that I was a Christian before joining your Adventist church. I love the Lord. I pleaded with my congregation every Sunday morning to make a fuller commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. But now he said that I have accepted the Adventist message, and particularly the Sabbath message. I feel that I'm offering to God not just lip service, but the service of my total being. Isn't that a beautiful testimony coming from someone who loved the Lord? And yet he found that through the Adventist message, the Sabbath message, he was able to express and experience a fuller commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. In closing, fellow believers and friends, 
We have seen this afternoon that the Sabbath is being attacked like never before. Why? Because it affects vitally our relationship with the Lord. We have seen that this controversy is not just about names, Saturday versus Sunday. It's not just about numbers, first day versus the seventh day. But it has to do with two different forms of worship. Lip type of service to God versus a service that engages our total being. And we have seen that today there is an incredible renewed interest for the Sabbath, which affords us a unique opportunity to proclaim the Sabbath more fully. But in order to proclaim the Sabbath more fully, we need to understand it more fully. We need to experience it more fully. And we also need to share it more fully. And my fervent hope and prayer is that the Sabbath may truly become for us our loving response to our Savior. May the Sabbath become for us the day when we stop our work because we want our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to work in us more fully and more freely. May the Sabbath truly become for us the day when we experience the awareness of the presence, peace, and rest of Christ in our lives. This is my prayer for each one of us tonight. Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Thank you, God, for reminding us tonight of this great controversy that is being waged around thy holy Sabbath day. We have seen how the Sabbath is being attacked today in a, in a subtle and deceptive way by different people from different quarters. And the reason why the holy day is being attacked because it vitally affects our relationship with Thee. The evil one knows that if he can undermine the Sabbath, ultimately he can undermine the Christian experience of so many people. We are grateful to Thee tonight, O God, that Thy Spirit has been touching so many lives, bringing so many people to a renewed understanding and the experience of the Sabbath. We will pray in a special way, O oh Lord, tonight, that Thou will use each one of us, first of all, to understand and experience the Sabbath more fully, and then to share it and proclaim it more fully with others. May the Sabbath truly become for us, O oh Lord, not a day of frustration, but a day of joyful celebration of Thy creative and redemptive love. May the Sabbath become the day when we draw closer to Thee and closer to one another, I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.